Well, let's go ahead and get started. Good evening. Um, Bridger Volskiri is really thrilled to be able to bring you this opportunity to learn more about this beautiful and priceless ecosystem that we live and recreate in. I'm Bonnie Hickey, Sustainability Director at Bridger Bowl. Uh, Bridger Bowl is a sponsor of Gallatin Valley Earth Day, featuring a series of webinars and events culminating in a day-long celebration of Earth Day at the end of April. When you stand on the ridge at Bridger Bowl, pictured behind me, you have an amazing view out to the crazy mountain range, the Absorcas, the Northern Gallatin range, and then behind us to the west and southwest lie the Horseshoe Hills, tobacco roots, and Spanish peaks. And maintaining the health and biodiversity of the region is important to us as human-driven change affects the landscape. We're grateful to have with us today the Center for Large Landscape Conservation to help us understand more about ecological connectivity and what it means for all of us that use and enjoy these lands and to learn a bit about how we can improve our care of the land. I'll turn this over to Sky Pisarski, Bridger Bowl's sustainability intern, who will be our moderator this evening. Thank you, Bonnie, for getting us started. Hi everyone, my name is Sky. I am a software studying sustainable food and bioenergy systems here at Montana State University. And I'm also have had the great privilege of interning with Bonnie at Bridger Bowl as a sustainability intern this season, which has been great. I, before I introduce our first speaker, just had a few really quick housekeeping things for everyone. So this webinar is being recorded so it can be rewatched later or shared and it will be posted both on the Bridger Bowl sustainability page and via Gallatin Valley Earth Day. And we will have both of those links available for you at the end of this webinar. Uh, we will be taking questions and answering them at the end as well. And we'll be doing that via chat. So feel free to enter your questions as they come up for you. You can find your chat at the bottom of your screen. It should be via that the, excuse me, via the options button. And you can find your chat that way, or also I believe the shortcut is Alt-H. So with all of that complete, I'd like to hand it over to our first speaker, Jamie Fassell. Jamie provides technical and logistical support to spatial and social science projects for the center and partners. She also helps produce educational and outreach materials with a focus on connectivity science. Jamie has experience in connectivity modeling and ecological research, as well as social science approaches. She holds, a, excuse me, she holds a master's degree in biology from Boise State University and a bachelor's degree in biology from Ursinus College. For her master's work at BSU, her research focused on understanding social, political, and biophysical barriers to long-term connectivity for reintroduced plains bison. Jamie is committed to engaging with local communities, rights holders, and stakeholders in her work. She has worked with indigenous communities both in Montana and internationally in South Africa, Assam, India, and Borneo, Malaysia. In her free time, Jamie enjoys snowboarding, hiking, reading, mountain biking, and petting dogs. Without further ado, I'm going to pass the torch to Jamie. All right, thank you so much, Bonnie and Sky, for your introductions and all of you for being here. Again, my name is Jamie Faselt, and I am the Connectivity Science Coordinator for the Center for Large Landscape Conservation, also called CLLC or the Center, uh, a Bozen-based nonprofit that works both locally and globally to connect lands and waters, support healthy wildlife habitats, and safeguard nature's resilience to climate change. Just to orient you briefly to this evening's webinar, um, I'm gonna I'm kicking it off with uh, what ecological connectivity is why it matters and what kinds of scientific approaches are taken for identifying locations important to either protect or restore. I will then pass things over to my colleague, Zach, and he will dive into how that science is used in terms of policy uh, and planning and projects on the ground. Before jumping into what ecological connectivity is, I want everyone to take a brief moment to think about what pops into your mind when you think about conservation. For me, it has always been pretty synonymous with protected areas. However, within the past few decades, it has become apparent that just creating and maintaining protected areas like national parks isn't enough to ensure biodiversity protection. As a result, there is growing recognition that ecological connectivity also needs to be prioritized. 
One definition of ecological connectivity is the unimpeded movement of species and the flow of natural processes that sustains life on Earth. Another, perhaps more poetic way to think about this is imagining protected areas such as national parks or national forests as the organs of biodiversity conservation and thinking about ecological connectivity as the circulatory system that sustains and connects those organs. Fragmentation, the reduction of continuous habitat into smaller spatially distinct patches, often surrounded by unsuitable habitat for species is the inverse of connectivity. Habitat degradation and fragmentation is considered a primary threat to biodiversity. And there are many different types of fragmenting features. These could be roads, railways, pipelines, fences, agricultural, residential, urban and commercial development or deforestation. It is important to both use science to try and avoid habitat fragmentation and to enhance or restore connectivity in already fragmented habitats. So why is ecological connectivity important? In short, animals need to move. Uh, this allows them to find shelter, find food and water sources. Connectivity also allows for seasonal migration for species. And unfortunately, given habitat loss and fragmentation, animal migrations have become an endangered phenomenon. These human caused disturbances don't just impact species that migrate on the land, such as bighorn sheep, elk, mu moose, mule deer, and pronghorns, uh, which all have their migration pathways mapped on the map on the image to the left on the left of the screen, but it also impacts migratory birds, such as snow geese, that require certain locations on their flight paths for stopovers as well as aquatic species that can be disrupted by things like dams. There are also short distance seasonal migrations that are important to consider, such as a salamander migrating a few kilometers from an upland forest to temporary ponds where they need to lay their eggs. In addition to connectivity supporting migrations and animals meeting their basic needs, many wildlife species travel away from their birthplace as subadults in order to establish their own territories or to find mates. They need to be able to safely traverse the whole landscape to find this habitat. Species dispersion also allows for genes to flow between subpopulations, and this allows populations to maintain genetic diversity when individuals move to new locations and subsequently breed. Genetic diversity is critical for species long-term survival as it allows populate wildlife populations to adapt to new environmental conditions and avoid the negative impacts of inbreeding. Mammalian carnivores in particular seem to make very long distance dispersal movements, such as lynx, mountain lions, wolves, and wolverines, as seen in the image here. They move across several states in search of new territories or mates. Unfortunately, in many cases, these dispersal movements can end in the death of the animal when they encounter a road or face other human impacts across the landscape, such as hunting, poaching, or poisoning. Connectivity also allows species to shift their geographic distributions as the climate changes. They need to move between areas that are climatically suitable now and areas that will be climatically suitable in the future given the changes in the climate. And a well-connected landscape makes these shifts possible. So here you can see in North America, mammals, birds, and amphibians often moving north in latitude, but also um, in the interactive map, you would be able to see that they also need to be able to move upwards in elevation to cooler areas. Finally, connected landscapes are also beneficial for humans as they provide a number of ecosystem services. These can include water regulation and protection, carbon sequestration, soil conservation, pest control, hunting and ecotourism opportunities, as well as pollination. Some of the tools we use to restore or maintain connectivity are corridors and crossings. Corridors are part of the landscape that allow animals to move between large areas of intact habitat seen in the middle panel here. Crossings are human built infrastructure designed to help wildlife safely cross roads and railways. We might not always be able to protect an entire corridor between protected areas, but the science can help us identify critical movement passages and habitat linkages. So what goes into the science of identifying these areas for connectivity conservation? 
probably not terribly surprising, but animal movement data is really helpful. And we now have radio transmitters and GPS devices that can be attached to even small animals such as insects. And there are huge databases of animal tracking data that can help scientists answer questions about connectivity. Citizen science also contributes lots of new information that scientists can use to improve our understanding of connectivity. One example is a cell phone app that allows citizens to report sightings of animals that are hit along road networks. These records help us determine locations where roads pose the greatest risk to both humans and wildlife, and where we should consider mitigation measures such as crossing structures. Connectivity conservation science also relies heavily on remotely sensed data. We use images from satellites and drones to understand things like forest loss, which you can see on the left, as well as land cover or elevation, such as at the upper right, and overall habitat suitability for different species. We can also use remotely sensed data from drones and satellite imagery to assess the degree of human modification, which you can see in the lower right-hand corner of the slide. We can use all of this data on animal movement and land cover, elevation, human modification, et cetera, to model connectivity for different species. A model is ultimately a scientific tool that represents a real world phenomenon, such as an animal moving across the landscape. Here's an example of a model that predicted the movement paths of grizzly bears between the greater Yellowstone ecosystem and the Northern Continental Divide ecosystem. You can see that the Bozeman Pass area is ranked as highly important by this purple color. These finer scale analyses can also help us identify potential barriers to movements. For instance, how will a grizzly bear safely get across Interstate 15 south of Butte? Models such as this can also be helpful for predicting conflict zones between humans and bears. Staff at CLLC also modeled connectivity for the Custer Gallatin National Forest, which encompasses the land that Bridger Bowl is on. CLLC was tasked with considering connectivity of over 700 species, and we developed a generic species approach that modeled connectivity for a hypothetical species meant to represent a broader group, such as a large forest specialist, as seen in the, image, in the figure here. The black outlines on this map show where the national forest is. The blue on the map shows where connectivity values are low. The green and yellow show intermediate connectivity values, and the red shows the highest connectivity values for, the, for this hypothetical large forest specialist species. The model results shown here highlight areas of the forest that are most critical for con connectivity needs, including linkages to other core habitats outside of the national forest. And when my colleague Zach presents on the policy and planning components of connectivity conservation, you will see how studies such as this can impact land management on the ground. We also conducted a spatial analysis with, a, we can also conduct spatial analyses with additional data besides animal locations and connectivity values. In this map, we analyze data on wildlife vehicle collisions, connectivity values, and an economic cost benefit analysis. The red and blue points show road segments that have the highest wildlife vehicle crashes and connectivity values, and where the wildlife vehicle collisions are costly enough to make building an overpass or underpass a financially beneficial decision. Studies such as this one can help land managers and departments of transportation prioritize locations to use limited funding on projects for wildlife. We have proven tools for restoring connectivity, particularly across roads. Scientific studies have shown that mitigation measures such as overpasses, underpasses, and culverts, which are especially important for aquatic species, can be about 90% effective. That is, they, present, they prevent 90% of animal vehicle collisions that would have occurred in their absence. While these projects may seem expensive, they can ultimately pay for themselves in collision-related sa savings. In conclusion, ecological connectivity is critical for the health of wildlife species and the science of connectivity si and connectivity science helps highlight important locations for protecting or restoring connectivity. There are also many policy tools and social components that are necessary to consider for achieving connectivity conservation. When we think about conserving large landscapes and connectivity, we know that there are human communities and their associated social and government structures that are a critical piece of this puzzle. 
With that, I'm going to pass it back to Sky to introduce the next speaker for the evening, who will dive into the social and policy sides of connectivity. Thanks for everyone's time. Thank you so much, Jamie. That was an awesome start to our webinar. Uh, we're going to keep things rolling, and I'm going to go ahead and introduce Zach. Zach works with the Corridors and Crossing team at the Center to advance large landscape conservation across the U.S. through policy guidance, applied research and collaboration with agency and non-governmental partners. A conservation social scientist by training, Zach has expertise in natural resource policy, land management planning, and monitoring and evaluation. Prior to joining the center in 2019, Zach earned a PhD in forest science from Colorado State University and worked as a research associate with the Colorado Forest Restoration Institute. He also holds a master's degree in political science from CSU, and bachelor's degrees in resource conservation and history from the University of Montana. In his free time, Zach enjoys snowboarding, fly fishing, hiking, cross-country skiing, and spending time with his wife and three daughters. Go ahead and take it away. Thanks a lot for the introduction, Sky. Uh, yeah, so Sky knows that I'm a Corvus and Crossings Program Director. Uh, and what I'm going to be talking about is really kind of picking up where Jamie left off, talking about what we do after we have the science. How do we turn that science into conservation on the ground? And again, to start, you know, connectivity conservation, as Jamie mentioned, involves maintaining and restoring landscape features that facilitate species movement or mitigating and minimizing barriers to species movement, such as roads or fences. Well, there's three things, oops, and this is not, there we go, sorry. <laughs> so there's three really important things uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna be talking about uh, that are important for actually creating connectivity conservation benefits on the, on the ground. And one is policy. What policy does is really provides the enabling conditions for connectivity conservation. Policy, whether it comes from the president's office or legislatures, provide, often provides funding for things like wildlife crossings, can provide mandates, uh, such as, you know, requirements that agencies consider connectivity when they're doing planning. And it also often results in, you know, requirements for integrating science into decisions. And that often happens, this can happen at a bunch of different layers that we'll talk about. Another key piece is planning. And planning is really the process where we integrate science and collaboration to identify priority locations for connectivity conservation. And this is really the process where you know, government agencies will work often with a number of different partners to collectively identify key areas for connectivity that should be a target of specific actions. Maybe it's a road crossing, maybe it's conservation. I should note that collaboration is really important and planning is really important for connectivity conservation because it's a cross-boundary issue. You know, animals are notoriously disrespectful of jurisdictional boundaries, um, and the planning process is really an important place where different groups can come together, such as land trusts, Nonprofit conservation organizations, federal agencies, local agencies can all come together and work together to conserve species movement across boundaries, informed by the science, of course. Finally, you know, these planning processes will result in priorities for on the ground actions. Um, and this is really kind of the end result of this process that's supported by all the other ones. So let's start with some of the policy aspects. Um, it's actually, past 10 years have been a great time for connectivity policy. We've really seen a tsunami of different policies at the federal, state, and local level for connectivity. So on the federal side, you know, as far back as 2012, we saw the Forest Service uh, come up with a policy that created requirements for considering habitat connectivity and forest planning processes. Uh, a little bit later, Secretary of Interior uh, announced uh, Secretary, uh, Secretary Memo 3362, which basically told the Interior uh, Department to work with states to identify key areas for wildlife movement. More recently, BLM has just come out with uh, a new policy for habitat connectivity that directs decision makers to consider it in planning and different types of actions. Um, and just last week, the White House released uh, guidance to all the different federal agencies to consider habitat connectivity. On the legislative side, we just saw $350 million get allocated by Congress as part of the Infrastructure Act to support the construction of wildlife crossings. All told, at the state level, we've also seen a lot of action. So I think there's been over 13 executive orders from governor's offices and, 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 and laws enacted uh, that specifically address habitat connectivity. What these do is either provide 
mandates for considering connectivity and say local planning. They also provide incentives and uh, really emphasize the use of voluntary measures like easements to conserve large scale corridors, which is what we're seeing in Florida. There's also just state legislative funding for wildlife crossings. A lot of governor's offices are, are, are asking state agencies to also develop wildlife corridor plans. So it's a really exciting time. As you will notice, uh, you know, we don't have any yet in Montana. Um, and I should note that, you know, one reason I think talking about policy is really important uh, is because if, if, if the public isn't aware of it and they're not really demanding connectivity policies, they're probably not going to happen. So um, I should note, too, the other great thing about habitat connectivity is it's a bipartisan issue. Um, you know, folks on both sides of the aisle uh, love animals and they want to see them thrive and survive. And so there's actually a lot of support for habitat connectivity policies. When we look at crossings in particular, um, you know, there's a really important human safety element, you know, and, and not, they're not just saving animal lives, they're often saving people's lives too. So let's take a look at, you know, how the science specifically can get uh, into a planning process. Um, one great example is the recently completed Custer Gallant National Forest. So what the Custer Gallant National Forest did is they took some of the science we produced and used it to inform some key elements in their recently completed forest plan, specifically designated key linkage areas. And if you look at the map on the left, you can kind of see where those red are, where the red stripes are. Those are really kind of critical corridors or modeled corridors for species movement. Well, there's one that goes right on the on the uh, east on the west side of the Bridgers. The Custer Gallatin, if you look on the right side of the screen there, then created a key linkage area in that place. And within that area, there's restrictions on development, and there's guidance to make sure that any development that does occur, any recreation, doesn't impact species movement. Another critical piece in this is direction to make sure that no Forest Service uh, planes are flying over the bridges during raptor migration in the fall. Um, and there's also a lot more direction um, further south, too, but this is probably one that's a little more relevant. So this is a great example of seeing how the how high level direction for planners to consider connectivity, science, and importantly, advocacy can make uh, substantive connectivity conservation happen on the ground. Should note, you know, a lot of these key linkage areas also wouldn't happen without a lot of public support from citizens and local nonprofits. Another great opportunity for integrated connectivity is in transportation planning. Um, and so this is this is one element, you know, transportation planning is a long drawn out process. Um, and so if you do want to build a wildlife crossing, it takes a long time and it, and it takes a lot of work uh, and, and assessments and evaluation. So our organization uh, about six or seven years ago helped create a group called Montana's for Safe Wildlife Passage. It's a collaborative group that helps uh, Montana Department of Transportation and Montana Wildlife work together to identify opportunities for reducing wildlife, um, human and vehicle collisions. Uh, one uh, recent outcome of this long of the process and our work with the agencies, the development of the Montana Wildlife and Transportation Partnership Planning Tool. And what this tool does is help identify key areas for uh, where, where, there's, where there's a lot of like wildlife, human, um, wildlife vehicle collisions. Um, that are going to be basically uh, potentially considered by planners in the transportation planning process. If you notice, uh, you know, right down around the northern uh, Yellowstone ecosystem, there's a lot of red. Um, well, as anybody who drives up and down 80, 89 knows, uh, it's it's a pretty uh, dangerous place because there's so many wildlife moving across the landscape. Same thing goes for 191. Um, our organization has been working with partners in on both these stretches. Uh, to assess potential locations where it might be feasible to implement uh, measures to reduce vehicle collisions and improve connectivity. Um, so in a couple of weeks, we've got a, a report um, on 191 coming out that highlights some potential areas for uh, mitigation and, and reducing co uh, collisions. 89, we're working with a whole host of different partners in Park County, uh, Greater Yellowstone Coalition, uh, to, to develop another assessment. In both these areas, we've also really uh, leaned on citizens to collect data that can inform these assessments. So um, we have a smartphone app called Roads that we've developed with our partners at Montana Transportation Institute 
uh, at Montana State University. And this basically allows citizens to note on their smartphone um, where they see either a, a carcass along the side of the road or live animals. Uh, that data can go onto a dashboard so we can get data and kind of start picking out hotspots uh, as people on the ground are seeing them. Another important opportunity for advancing connectivity conservation is at local levels, the county and local governments. So there's actually a lot of tools that local governments can use to conserve connectivity, particularly uh, in the face of growth. Um, a lot of counties out west use open space bonds to purchase lands. Um, one, key, one key consideration is that you could probably do this for key corridors and linkage areas. There's also tools for really incentivizing or mandating cluster development. And you can see on the right, you know, this is a strategy where you can either provide tax incentives to developers or have enshrined in zoning to basically minimize the, the spatial footprint of development. Other interesting ones are, you know, density uh, uh, mandates and incentives sort of to build, build up rather than out. And these are really key issues for this whole region. You know, um, right here is a two aspects of a study that was done by MSU students. Um, it shows different scenarios for growth in uh, the Gallatin Valley. And again, this isn't just about Bozeman. I know Bozeman gets a lot of attention, but we're seeing growth everywhere from Livingston to Cody. Um, and so it's something that counties and local governments do have power to look at. Right now, Gallatin County is undertaking a sensitive lands protection assessment. They're going to be analyzing different data, including connectivity, and making recommendations for potential tools that local governments can use. Really great example of uh, local uh, efforts is down in Teton County and around Jackson, Wyoming. So Teton County actually paid and, and uh, commissioned a highway vehicle assessment from that was completed by Montana Transportation Institute. And a year after it was completed, uh, they put up on the ballot um, something under their special excise tax. And that's basically money that comes from an extra penny on sales tax. And voters overwhelmingly voted to use that funding to build some wildlife crossings. Uh, at the end of this summer, I think they're gonna, they should have the preliminary designs done. Um, and so they'll probably start looking at building wildlife crossings in Teton County uh, sometime in the next couple of years. Besides all the different policy aspects, it's important to remember too, there's, there's a lot of things private landowners and citizens can do. Um, one really important thing is wetlands and stream corridor restoration. And this, is, this can be done really easy. So doing things like creating beaver dam analogs, basically mim mimicking beaver dams, that can elevate the water table, increase riparian vegetation, and that can help facilitate species movement. Uh, a lot of science shows some of the best areas for species movement are, are along river and stream corridors, particularly in the vegetation. Another thing landowners can do is install wildlife friendly fencing. Uh, often this means, you know, modifying your fencing so you don't have barbed wire in the bottom. You got a smooth wire board. It's a little bit higher. That way species such as pronghorn get under um, and they often get caught a lot in regular barbed wire fencing. For, and for folks living in town, um, pollinator gardens in our yards, we may not think about, you know, um, pollinator gardens as it being important for connectivity. But what they do is create little stepping stones for flying insects and birds that allow them to move across the landscape. Um, even little things like turning off our lights, non-essential lights during bird migration season uh, is another thing pretty much anybody can do. And again, too, there's, there's a lot of opportunities to get involved in citizen science. In fact, if you're interested in collecting uh, data using our roads app, if you drive down up and down 89 a lot, um, you know, please get in touch with us. We'd love, love to have you involved. And finally, there's things ski areas can do. Um, and there's a lot of a lot of ski areas across the country and across the West are increasingly paying attention to connectivity. Uh, vail Resorts in Colorado actually funded um, a wildlife crossing feasibility study. Others are looking at even how they can, you know, better develop existing ex new expansions to make sure species can still move. And talk a little bit about uh, what Bridger Bowl is doing. I'm going to turn it back over to Bonnie. Thanks, Zach. One of the great things about 
working at Bridger Bowl is being able to view the variety of wildlife that lives there or passes through um, animals such as bobcat, moose, elk, deer, bear, mountain goats, and more. And to lessen Bridger's impact and support the health of the area, um, some of our summer work includes things like maintaining a strong noxious weed control program, um, which just this summer we received Gallatin County's first weed management award for, um, and using native seed to restore slopes and control erosion. Uh, we also partner with the Forest Service in integrating insect and disease management programs to maintain forest health. We leave material to provide cover when we remove hazard trees, um, follow Again, as Zach mentioned, the flight restrictions over the ridge during the raptor migration. And another example of changes we've made to our operations include removing the old boundary ropes and replacing them with extra signage. Um, that helps uh, prevent entanglements by moose. Uh, we're also working with government agencies, uh, local outdoor recreation clubs and nonprofits to improve trail signage in the brid bridgers and plan work that's protective and mindful of those wintering habitats and key linkage areas. And we talked about the Raptor Fest. During the Raptor migration in early October, Sacagawea Audubon and Bridger host Raptor Festival. And that's an opportunity for families to come learn about raptors and how they use the Bridger range. We have tabling from over 25 businesses, government agencies, NGOs, and nonprofits um, bringing really fun family-oriented educational activities and presentations, including birdhouse building and live bird presentations. And I hope that you'll all be able to join us at that event. So Jamie and Zach have provided some really thought-provoking and valuable insights for us to be mindful of um, as we go about our days and, and our work. Um, Sky, uh, do we have any questions in the chat that we want to bring forward? I have not seen any questions at this point. If anyone wants to pose any, we are ready for you. I do have one that I can start us out with. So for Jamie and Zach, I'm curious, when something like a wildlife crossing is put in, do animals prefer to cross on their bridge? and then they stop crossing on the road or how does that work? Uh, that's a really great question, Sky. Um, and really when we say build an overpass or underpass, it should be accompanied with fencing and jump outs, but that, does, that doesn't sound as catchy as overpass or underpass. But yeah, so when we build those structures, you also put fencing along so that animals are sort of funneled to these crossing structures so that they don't keep crossing at the road. Um, so yeah, really good question. And Zach, if you have anything to add to that. Yeah, and over time, we actually see use increase if they kind of get used to it. And so um, they do. It does depend, you know, some different species prefer overpasses more than underpasses. Um, you know, some animals might get scared about, you know, getting um, attacked by it large carnivore underpasses. So I think it, it there are some real nuances, but overall fencing, overpassing, and underpasses are, are really effective both at reducing uh, the collisions and improving connectivity and facilitating species movement. Got it. That's awesome. I've been really curious about that. And then I had one more for myself. Um, I'm curious, could you tell us a little bit more about the app? Is that something that like people all over Montana can use? Yes, it is. Uh, well, actually, no. <laughs> I think uh, it's something we are looking at expanding, um, but it's it's really going to work best in areas where there's like a real need for data and potential kind of planning processes that it could inform. Um, so what we kind of recommend is this would be moving forward. You know, if if it looks like there's going to be more funding for crossings and there's partners in place. Um, that's when, you know, and there's a lot of interest, that's when we really look to start setting it up. Um, but I wouldn't recommend just doing it everywhere quite yet. 
um, 190, no, 191 and 89 are in their pretty good places right now. So thanks, Guy. Got it. And, and there are sorry, um, some different, you know, it's not just roads and, you know, specific to our work in terms of citizen science that can help aid connectivity science and studies on a whole. There's different reporting apps for different human wildlife conflict. I know Canada has a really robust um, wildlife conflict reporting system. So there's all sorts of different things that uh, you can look into if you just, you know, Google citizen science. There's a lot of different ways that folks can ultimately contribute to uh, all of that. That is all great information. Thank you guys so much. Uh, we do have a couple of questions from the audience. So from Garth, thank you, Garth. Any proposals in the works for wildlife crossing, excuse me, wildlife crossings over 90 west of Bozeman Pass or over Bridger Canyon Road? So I don't believe there's anything formal yet. Like I don't believe it's on, you know, uh, the queue with the state agencies, but um, I, I think most folks around here agree that would be a great place to have wildlife crossing. Uh, there are some, you know, kind of uh, technical and, and feasibility issues involved with construction and constructing one there, but um, yeah, that's, that's not a great answer, but yeah, I, I think it'd be great if we built one there. Awesome. Uh, we also have a, another question from Christine. Are there any other ways to prevent wildlife vehicle collisions other than building wildlife overpasses and underpasses? Yeah, great question. Um, so you might see warning signs, uh, right? It just says warning elk crossing. Um, and those are not shown to be as, quite as effective. Uh, so I've got, I pulled it up, it's, those are nine to 50% effective. There's animal detection systems. So when you've got like a signage with uh, flashing lights that shows that animals are crossing in the area, um, that's shown to be 33 to 97% effective. Um, you can close, you know, if you know that an area is super important for migration, a seasonal migration, you can do a seasonal closure on a road, which is 100% effective in preventing wildlife collisions. Um, and then you can also, you know, try to increase visibility for species, uh, reduce traffic speeds, um, uh, or relocate animals. So there are lots of different ways, but the overpasses and underpasses, especially if you can do both, um, but even just one has been shown to be about 90% effective at reducing those wildlife vehicle collisions. Great, thank you so much for that information, Jamie. Um, we don't have any more questions at this time. So I will just point out to everyone that these websites on your screen right now are all really great resources. Um, so much to learn about the Center for Large Landscape Conservation. We are so lucky to have them here in Bozeman. Bridger Bowl, if you wanna see all of the work that Bridger is doing sustainability-wise, it's super impressive. Again, very lucky to have them as leaders in our community. And I can't recommend enough also Gallatin Valley Earth Day um, for just a wealth of webinars and information on there. Um, we will wrap up with a thank you to everyone. Thank you to the Center for Large Landscape Conservation. Thank you, Jamie, Zach, and Christine for participating in this with us. Um, thank you to Bridger Bull. Thank you to Bonnie. Thank you to the marketing crew and everyone else at Bridger, everyone who's doing sustainability, the nitty gritty, pulling stuff that doesn't belong in the compost out. We see you and we appreciate you. And thank you lastly to Gallatin Valley Earth Day and actually to everyone for being here. Thank you for taking the time and coming to our webinar. Thank you. Good night.